Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, Brother Tripp. How you doing, sir? I'm well. How are you today? Doing good. Doing good. It, uh, I guess we're starting to get a little more used to this thing. What do you think? Yeah, it's starting to get a little less nerve-wracking. and It, uh, uh, it doesn't still quite feel normal yet. No. <laughs> Hopefully... <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't have to become No, that, this shouldn't right? become <laughs> normal, I, I guess. is uh, uh, it, it works for now, and I think I think uh, a lot of people are, are watching these services, and I think they're they're enjoying it. They're spending uh, just some time focused on this. We we had, as the pre-roll ran, some folks sent in their, their pictures of thankfulness, and we, we've got some more that will be at the end of the end of the service as well. For stick, stick around for those after Brother Tripp's done, done preaching. If you... If you forgot to send them in and you want to add your own, um, shoot a text to me, 403-2217, or, or email them to us, and we'll put them on next week because it looks like with uh, some of the updates to uh, to the, the flattening of this curve, um, looks like this is going to be our normal at least through April. Yes. Um, we'll, we'll get to that here in a minute. I guess uh, a lot of people get a real kick out of seeing... Uh, the songs and the videos and whatnot. So I'm going to get started with uh, with your family on a song, and this song is the Lighthouse. We got two songs that feature you today. How did your pipes feel? You think they're you ready to sing? <laughs> uh, yes, sir. The yes, the sir. trips are still getting used to this whole singing to a camera thing. So our first song of the morning is going to be Lighthouse. lighthouse on the hillside that overlooks life's sea when I'm tossed it sends out a light that I might see and the light that shines in darkness thou will safely lead me o'er if it was for the lighthouse this ship would be no more and I thank God for the lighthouse I owe my life to him Jesus is the lighthouse and from the rocks of sin he has shown the light around me that I could clearly see if it wasn't for the lighthouse where would this ship be everybody that lives around us says tear that lighthouse down the big ships don't sail this way anymore no use in it standing round then my mind goes back to that stormy night when just in time i saw the light was a light from that old lighthouse that stands up there on the hill and I thank God for the lighthouse I owe my life to Him Jesus is the lighthouse And from the rocks of sin He has shown the light around me That I might clearly see if it wasn't for the lighthouse, where would this ship be? If it wasn't for the lighthouse, where would this ship be? All right, Brother Tripp, we're back. A lighthouse. It's a good one. Yeah, it's been a favorite of mine for a long time. Uh, yeah, it's a song that uh, I think Squire Parsons wrote it, right? Yes. And uh, he has his own songbook. Yeah. I, I've got it. It's like 
you, you think of a few of his songs and uh, a guy that go to our, went to our church for a long time, Bill Durham, sang a lot of Squire Parsons songs. That's one of the ones he would sing. He also sang Hello Mama. and yeah. was, he, he wrote a lot of really good songs. We, we appreciate that song. Well, Brother Tripp, let's uh, kind of give folks an idea of what we're looking at over the course of the next month. you want to give us an update on what we're looking at? Yeah, basically uh, looking to uh, continue the live stream services from now to the end of April. Um, we had mentioned that possibly would have some updates uh, regarding our Easter Sunday service. Uh, we've been working um, uh, kind of frantically in a sense, trying to find some equipment that would be needed to do uh, a drive-in service, but I think every church in our country uh, had the same idea. And so those items that we needed uh, at least at this point, it's looking like we're not going to be able to get a hold of those. So at this point, um, we will continue just to do the live stream service. Um, but if something uh, was to happen where we can get our hands on that equipment, uh, we will definitely update you and let you know uh, so that we could have a uh, drive-in service where you would pull into the parking lot, turn on your FM radio, and I could uh, preach to each, uh, each of you at that time. But as of right now, uh, it's kind of not looking like it's going to work out, but uh, we're still trying, got some people still looking. So um, just if the Lord wants it to happen, I believe it will. If not, we'll just continue forward the way we are right now. And uh, we'll just... I, uh, I called a manufacturer that makes one of the products that a lot of these churches are using. Um, this was earlier in the week. And I, he said... Uh, I asked him about an FM broadcast. He goes, you're with a church, aren't you? Yeah, I'm, I'm with the church. He goes, well, we've been sold out for a week. <laughs> and then he, he chuckled. He goes, last year we sold 20 of those. <laughs> and he said, you're the 15th call I've had today. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's it's not something you think about. But uh, first it was toilet paper, and yeah. and then it was milk and flour, and now it's FM broadcasters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A device that next to no one uses, but uh, right. yeah, we we couldn't get our hands on one. As far as uh, how we're going to do it, we're going to keep doing our live stream each Sunday at 11. Um, we're going to kind of set them up as the watch parties thing. We're trying, as you might notice here, we're we're trying to set these up so that uh, we can interact with you a little bit while the sermons are going on. Uh, we're going to continue to have some special songs. Um, in fact, we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and transition into our our next song now. This is Brother Tripp singing by himself, and uh, this song is God Makes No Mistakes. My life I give to you, O Lord, use me, I pray. May I glorify your precious name in all I do and say. Let me trust you in the valley dark as well as in the light. Knowing you will always lead me, your will is always right. I know God makes no mistakes. He leads in every path I take along the way that's leading me to home. Though at times my heart would break, there's a purpose in every change He makes that others would see my life and know that God makes no mistake. And when someday in heaven above I see His dear face, may I then be counted faithful as a runner in this race. But now I'm trusting in the Savior to show me the way. In His righteousness He guides me as I seek to please Him day by day. I know God makes no mistakes. He leads in every path I take 
along the way that's leading me to home. Though at times my heart would break, there's a purpose in every change He makes that others would see my life and know that God makes no mistake. That others would see my life and know that God makes no mistake. God makes no mistake. That's right. We've learned something uh, with one of these videos that uh, when you're doing live, Yes, um, I actually received an update from Brother Jason Wyckoff. Um, he is back home now. Um, things are going in the right direction. Uh, his body is reacting the way the doctors were hopeful uh, that, it, they, that he would react. So as of right now, um, they had told him in the beginning he would, he would probably be going back for a second treatment because uh, his cancer being in the stage four, um, but everything's looking very good. He's going through some more blood testing, but it looks as if right now, towards the end of May, uh, beginning of June, he'll go back for that second treatment, which should be the last treatment he needs, and we're just praying for a full recovery, that God would just allow this uh, time and these treatments um, uh, as a healing process for his body and give him more time with his family, and, and uh, just keep him in your prayers. Also, just want to remind you, um, the GoFundMe page for him is still open. We are still uh, trying to raise money to help him. Uh, the original cost just for the treatments were almost $50,000. That's not accounting for hotels and food away from home, being off work, uh, just the, the things that add into that. So uh, you'll notice we put the, uh, the goal is $75,000 on the GoFundMe for him. Um, and that is, I think we're getting close to maybe $20,000. Uh, but really, if you can, I know right now times are, are crazy and things are, are a little strange, but we're just trying to help a brother in the, in the Lord out to, uh, to be able to handle these um, uh, costs and things that, that come from this. So if the Lord would lay it on your heart, um, you, you can uh, take part in that. Also, um, uh, Miss Jess, uh, from what I gather, is, is you know, progressing. Still got uh, you know, uh, little ways to go with recovery, but... Um, I know uh, things are going well for her, so you continue to pray for her, continue to pray for the Fishback family. I did get to talk to Miss Debbie a little bit, and, and uh, I know it's going to be a process. It's, it's a change uh, for her and for the whole family. Um, so you be in prayer as they transition. Uh, number one, just transitioning from not having Brother John there um, and, and the way that affects their lives, and then also continue to pray for Nate and Annette uh, with the loss of their baby. Um, and uh, my parents, um, uh, kind of a, a little bit of an odd uh, situation, I know, uh, with my daughter having her child uh, back in March. Uh, they, because of all this, have not been able to travel up to see the baby, and I know my mom is chomping at the bit to get up here to see uh, uh, little Joseph, but um, you just pray for them. Uh, thankfully, right now, I believe they're all doing well. Um, and uh, Lord willing, before too long, they'll be able to get, uh, get up here to see uh, the baby and see the rest of us. So anything else, Brother Alex, on your end? No, I think, uh, I think that has most of it. I was hopeful to hear about your parents. I'm glad they're doing well. We prayed for your mom's treatments as well. We were talking about Brother Wyckoff's treatments. I think before we turn it over to you, I've just a couple brief announcements as far as Sending in your tithes and offerings, um, you can mail those here to the church if you'd like, or you can go to the church website and do that through Easy Tithe and do those online transactions. But I uh, wanted to encourage you to do that. Uh, Nathan's going to be checking out here at the church, uh, making sure that things get here. So if you do mail it, we someone's here at the church nearly every day checking on that stuff so you don't have to worry about that getting lost. Uh, before we turn it over to Brother Tripp, we've got one more video. It's my daughter this time. She, uh, she wanted to sing, and Miss Lydia indulged her. So we have uh, Lorelai Cunningham singing, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. I had 
That's my daughter, guys. <laughs> and she was playing outside a little bit before we did that. And Mama was at work today, so that's what happens when Dad does daughter's hair. It's just how it goes. Well, Brother Tripp, we're getting ready to get into your sermon. You've got it changed forever. If, uh, if everybody got to watch on Wednesday, it was about being stirred but not changed. Are we on a, are we on a little bit of a theme here? Is the <laughs> Lord talking to you on a common goal? Well, we're, we're going to be in Luke chapter 23, but yes, yeah, just um, all week long, the, uh, of course, the crucifixion, uh, not just because of this time of year, but just has been uh, in my devotions, in my thoughts, and, and the Lord uh, has put a thought on my heart, um, a little bit different angle uh, than I've ever looked at it before, and I and, uh, just want to bring those thoughts to you uh, today as our church family. So, um, in Luke chapter 23 is where we're going to be this morning. As you're turning there, I, I kind of want you to help me with your imagination. You know, a lot of times um, the Lord dealt with parables. He dealt with things that helped us give a visual picture in our minds uh, to help us understand the simplified things. And we uh, today uh, are going to Luke chapter 23 to the crucifixion crucifixion scene and and uh, just want you to help me a little bit and, and to think about, you know, the day of crucifixion. For us, that's a little different because we don't, we don't practice that in our country right now, you know, you know in, in the world right now. It's, it's something that was totally different back then. Um, it was uh, a day that had been set and prepared. Uh, three criminals were due uh, to be uh, executed that day. Um, as you know, Barabbas and these two other thieves uh, that didn't, they weren't named, but those three men were the three that were uh, due to be executed that day, that day of crucifixion. And as, as the story goes, as you know, over the next you know, uh, little bit of time, things changed that day forever for, for a few people just that were directly connected. And that's kind of what we want to look at a little bit today. But, but I want to look at how that change just the, the changes that came about that day that have changed the course of eternity for all of us forever. And so uh, with that thought, just try to take yourself, in, 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 you know, I know some of you have maybe seen movies or whatever for, of the uh, crucifixion and what our thoughts would be that they might look like or may have sounded like or, you know, I, I guarantee you none of us uh, totally understand how brutally he was marred for us just by the the way the bible talks about him not even being couldn't even tell he was a human uh, and and that in my mind it just it just it's hard to wrap our minds around but but just setting that tone of of being there you know being in the crowd maybe being uh, around and 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 the course of the uh, of what happens um you know Barabbas here was known uh the, the bible tells us that he had uh, he wasn't only a robber, but he had, he had actually committed murder, and that's why he was due to be uh, uh, executed. These other two men were thieves, and we don't know for a fact, but, but part of me kind of tells me they were somehow linked together in this insurrection that was going on. Um, and, you know, 
I could just imagine as Barabbas is sitting there in his cell waiting to be taken and nailed to a cross. You know, his mind and, and, and thinking and hearing all the things outside and, and just all the things. But, but one thing that changed for Barabbas was when the, the Roman guards came and looked at him and said, Hey, Pilate has given the order to release you. You know, that changed. That was a change in Barabbas' life. In the, in the physical side of life, he no longer was going to die that day. He, he no longer was going to be executed for the wrongs he had committed, but the people were crying for him to be delivered to them and for Jesus to take his place. So thinking about Barabbas and, and how that affected him. And then, you know, I kind of got to thinking of, I wonder what the other criminals thought about that. You know, why not them? Why not one of them instead of Barabbas? Why, why Barabbas? Why, why not one of them? If they were all kind of together in this and they were, you know, whatever was going on, why Barabbas and why, why not one of them? So thinking not only for Barabbas, the change was like, wow, he gets to go back home to his, his family. And I don't know if it changed his life forever. We don't hear a lot about that, but one, you know, that's one of the questions. I don't know how some of you are. I've got questions that I'm going to want to ask uh, when I get to heaven or find out or go find you know, somebody that, that was there, that knew. Um, but, but I wonder how that affected Barabbas' life forever. I mean, just can imagine what he had gotten involved in to the place where he actually killed somebody and he's getting ready to be executed and they open the cell door and say, you're free to go. How did that change his life forever? How did this change... For just a moment, those criminals thinking about, wow, Barabbas gets to go home. We're still going to die. We're still going to be executed for our wrongs. So I, I, thinking about that and coming into this story, I can think of that now. They know their buddy Barabbas is free and he's back in the crowd and he's back with his family. He's probably ran home uh, to, to tell his wife what's going on and his kids or whatever. And they are now, I can even see the, the vehemency that even builds up even more in them that, you know, that it was unfair that they have to go be executed and He didn't. And now, Jesus has been thrown in the midst of them. Jesus, and, and I'm sure they've heard uh, the, the stirrings about Jesus. They've all, you know, of course they've heard the religious people that day as, as they were chanting to crucify Him and the words of, of them saying that He had made Himself, you know, God. And they were, you know, uh, just all the, the taunting and the mocking and, and all the things that were going on. And so as we come into this story in a mindset of just thinking through this process, I think a lot of times you kind of have to, when you sit down and read the Bible, because of the way the Lord taught even, I believe we have to as individuals bring ourselves mentally into not only the context of Scripture, but into the atmosphere. What was this really like? You know, just to read the words of this story is not enough. We've got to take... He gave us an imagination and a mind, I believe, to think about what's going on through this whole situation. So with saying that, I, I wanted to look at Luke 23, verse number 35 is where we'll begin for sake of time. But he says, And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others? Let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew, This is the king of the Jews. One of the male factors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. So what I see first is the common approach that all it seemed like all the people around at the moment, they were all kind of on the bandwagon together. You see the religious people, the rulers, the soldiers... The thieves even kind of joining in and, and, and taking that common approach to this Jesus that has now been thrown in their midst. And, 
and and they're saying, you know, if if you know, if he is who he says he is, have you know, he said in, in verse 35, if he be Christ, the chosen of God, mocking him and saying he saved others, himself he cannot save. So the common approach of this day for the rulers, the religious people, for the for the for the soldiers, and and even for the thieves that were 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 crucified beside him, the common approach was, if thou be, prove it to us. If you're really who you say you are, save yourself and us. That approach was. A mocking approach. And, and as I read this, and this time reading this, the first time I ever really had this thought, but I, the thought, when you, when you hear these words, I began to hear something else ringing out in my ears. There was someone else that was asking the same questions. If you remember when Jesus Christ was taken out into the wilderness and tempted for 40 days. And the, and the devil was tempting him. If you go to those Scriptures, you will find that Satan, his words to Christ were, If thou be the Son of God. And so, what I begin to hear is the, the common approach that comes down from the devil. It comes down from the father of this world, so to speak. The, the, the one who from the beginning has been trying to deceive people and trying to, to get people to ask that question, if thou be the Son of God, if thou be the Son of God. And Satan, that's what he was asking the Lord. If you're the Son of God, then do this. If you're the Son of God, then do that. If you're the Son of God, then do this. These people were saying the same thing. You know, and the Lord... Over in, in uh, I believe it's in, in, in John chapter number 8. John chapter number 8. I didn't write this verse down, but... The one I'm trying to think of is, is where the Lord um, was basically talking to the, the people there and was telling them that their father was the devil because of, of, of what they, they were not believing in him and they were basically questioning him and, and, and just having that understanding that even the common approach from these people, they were asking the same questions because they were children of the devil. We don't like to even talk like that. We don't even like to think like that. But you, either, you only can serve two masters. You can only serve our father. Jesus Christ. Or you can, you, you can serve the devil. These people had the same common approach and they were asking, if thou be the Son of God. If thou be the Christ. Today I would like to pose the question to you as we're thinking about the crucifixion scene, as we're thinking about this time when these three men were due to be crucified, to be executed, and now Jesus is thrown in the midst of them. There are several people that, that I have even heard in my own life, but there are people all over this world who are still saying things like, well, if He is truly God, then why doesn't He do this? And why doesn't He do that? If that is your approach today, I would warn you that that same approach comes from Satan himself. Because I say to you today, the question is not if he is the Son of God. The statement is, he is the Son of God. We should not take the common approach of this world and hopefully today, my prayer is that you do not ask those questions in your if he really is who and you hopefully you're not you know saying those things and it's almost like taunting him prove yourself to me if you're really who you say you are but they were all taking after their father the devil and Jesus 
said that to them, and I'll have to find that passage of Scripture and, and relay it to you. I might be thinking of the wrong book and chapter, but the next thing that I want you to see in this story is if you were to read over in Matthew chapter 27, and we'll go there quickly, Matthew chapter 27, in verse number 44, we have this same story, and it tells us in verse 44, it says, The thieves also which were crucified with Him cast the same in His teeth. So we, we understand that both thieves in the beginning... Both of them were casting the same thing as everybody else. They were mocking Him. They were both taunting Him. But I'd like for you to look back at Luke 23 and verse number 40. Because in verse 39 it tells us, And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. You know, both of these thieves started out the same. Both of them started on the same path. Both of them, if you, they had, they had lived very similar lives. They had been thieves. They had been, you know, robbing people. We don't know all the things that they had done, but we know they had broke the law to a point so bad that even the Romans felt that it was due that they would die and be executed for whatever they had done. Both these were casting the same in the face of Jesus, but one of them, something happened, something changed. And you know, we're not told exactly at what point this changed. We're not told, you know, we, we weren't there, so I couldn't look at him and tell you that he just something just happened or was stirring in his heart. And I can only think that, that there were times in his life that he had heard about Jesus. He had, he had been around uh, people that had talked about Jesus. We don't know, but I believe some way, somehow, his life had been either connected or a family member or something had been touched by Jesus. And he knew of Jesus. But he had chosen to refuse who Jesus was. But I can tell you something, something happened, something changed in his life. Go back to verse 4, he says, But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? You know, that's kind of, <clears throat> that's kind of a, a, in, a, in a sense, it, it, not a silly question, but at the same time, I, I bet the other thief probably was thinking, even if he didn't say it, he, he, he was thinking in his mind, well, yeah, we don't fear God. That's why we're being executed. That's why we've gotten ourselves to this point. We don't fear God. That, that was a common thought to them. So, the change, what changed with this thief? I don't know exactly what it was. But I believe there was a stirring in that thief's heart. And if you think about it, there were one on either side of Jesus. There were one on either side so in order for him to converse with the other one, I could just imagine him turning and, and looking to the other thief. But as he's looking to the other thief, you've got to remember that he heard the words of Jesus when he was first crucified as he looked at the soldiers that were parting his garments. He looked at the soldiers that had beaten him. They put on a purple robe and mocked him and smote him with their fist and spat in his face and, 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 and asked him to prophesy who hit him and, and all those things, all that those Roman soldiers did to mock him and to make fun of him and to brutally just beat him to a bloody pulp. He heard him look at those soldiers and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That thief had to hear that. And no matter what he had heard before, no matter what he had seen, he saw the forgiveness of God on that cross. He saw the love that Jesus had. Even in the state he was in, he was forgiving those men who were still mocking him, who still hated him, who didn't give one thought 
to the pain, to the mockery, to any of that, to the shame that Jesus was bearing for them, and Jesus still forgave them. My thought also is, you would have to be, I believe, a very hard individual to be that close to Jesus and to see that much love poured out and not be changed forever. But that one thief... Now again, I, I, want, I want to look at this. The change that happened in him. Look at what he says in verse number 41. He says, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man had done nothing amiss. He knew enough about Jesus that he knew Jesus was innocent. Jesus hadn't done anything. Jesus was the spotless Lamb of God. And somehow, from somebody that may have told him, or, or whatever the case might be, we see that this thief... He had a change of mind and a change of heart on the cross. And he said, you know what? We're getting what we deserve. We deserve to be hanging here. But this man has done nothing amiss. And I believe that thief saw further into the reasoning being a Jewish man, being and having the understanding of all this, I believe things began to make sense to him and, and the truth was made known to him and, and he accepted the fact. Let me show you something. Because in verse 42 it says, And he said unto Jesus, Lord. When he said the word Lord, that means he was accepting the fact that Jesus would be his master. Jesus was going to be His Savior. He, he was accepting what Jesus had done for him. Just that terminology, He's speaking to the Lord and He's saying, Will you remember Me? He says, Lord, remember Me when Thou comest into Thy kingdom. So He understands that He's King. He's understanding that He is the King of the Jews. He's understanding that He is the spotless Lamb that died for the sin of the world. And he simply looked at Jesus and said, Lord, will you remember me? You know, if you've never seen the grace of God work, this is a place where you can really see the grace of God work because this man, his hands were nailed to a cross. He didn't have time to go to Sunday school. He didn't have time to go uh, help his neighbor. He didn't have time to do any good works. He didn't have time to do anything. All he did was he believed that Jesus Christ was dying for more of a reason than people hated him. He wasn't dying just because people hated him. He was dying because he was the sacrifice for the sin of the whole world. Today, the last thing I want to do is I want to give you the challenge that this same thief gave to his partner in crime. Look at what he says in verse number 40. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? You know, one of the thoughts that I have is that he even brought up the name God. God. You know, that he even brought up the... Of, so something tells me either as a child, this boy had heard the Scriptures, he had heard, and his, his parents had maybe read him the Scriptures, and he had been told, I'm sure he had heard the words. Somewhere, somehow, the Word of God had been implanted in his heart, in his mind, in his ears, because the Bible tells me that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And because his life was changed... He challenged that other thief and asked him the question, Dost not thou fear God? Don't you fear God at all? Don't you understand? I believe he's basically saying to him, Don't you understand what's happening here? I would challenge you today. If you are not saved, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I will tell you right now, 
It has nothing to do with any works of any shape, any form at all. Because this man on this cross had no way of doing anything. He only had a moment of time. But the words of Christ and the presence of Christ was so powerful that it changed his mind and his heart. And it changed his life forever. And I'm asking you today, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ, that you would allow Him to change your eternity forever. I challenge you today to think about Jesus on that cross and what He did for us. He became sin. He became sin for me. He became sin. He... He took all of it for me. I am not saved today because I've chosen to live for Him and I've chosen to try to do everything I can to get other people to see the love of Christ. That's not why I'm saved. I do those things because I am saved. Because I love my Savior. But today, just as He looked at this thief, look at what He says in verse 43. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. I want you to see one more thing that I never really thought about before until this past week. You will notice Jesus never replied to anybody that said, If thou be the Son of God. He never replied to any of them. He didn't say anything to this other thief that was railing on him saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. He didn't have a reply for him. But as soon as this other thief reached out to him, he called on him. As he tells us in his word, he will hear us. And he answered him and he said, Verily, that means truly, I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Let me ask, people, if you have, if, if, if any of you have never accepted Christ, today can be your day of salvation. He doesn't wait five years. He doesn't tell you to hold off. No, He says today, right now. Right now, your life can be changed for eternity. And my prayer is that you look at the crucifixion scene and understand what it is and understand what it means to us. The Lord tells us that to us, He said that the preaching of the cross is foolishness. You know, it's foolishness to them that perish, the Bible says. If, you know, the preaching of the cross is foolish to a lot of people in this world. But he says to us, it is the power of God. Why is it the power of God? One more passage and I'm done. Why is it so powerful? It's as simple as this. John chapter 1 and verse number 12. It says, But as many as received Him, but as many as received Him, to them gave He power, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. You know why the preaching of the cross is so powerful to me? Because it's such a great reminder of what He did for me and the love of God that was shown forth into my family and into my heart and into my children and my wife and the church family and all those people that I've met all throughout my life that their life has been changed because of the love of God. That's the power. It's powerful to us. My prayer is today that it would be powerful to you. Please allow the love of God to change your life forever. You know, we've got a lot of things going on around us. We've got a lot of things happening. Here in another month or so, things will start spinning around, going back to normal. The effects will be around for a little while, but... Five or ten years down the road, this would just be something we talk about. But you know what? I was thinking as well. On a day, three criminals were going to die. There was a change. Jesus took the place of Barabbas. But He took His place for us. And just because Jesus made that decision to love us the way He did, over 2,000 years over 2,000 years, people are still being changed forever.
and you can be one of those people today. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you and we thank you. We thank you for your love. Lord, we get to a point we can't even talk about the cross and, and what you did for us without it just stirring our hearts and, Lord, and just bringing tears to our eyes, knowing the love that you had for us. God, I pray that you would be with anyone under the sound of our voice today that is not saved by the grace of God. They too, just like the thief, had a change of heart. That's what repentance is, is a changing of the heart and the mind towards sin and understanding that we are getting what we deserve. We, we deserve death because we're sinners. But Jesus Christ said, no, you don't have to. He said, I came into this world not to condemn the world, but He came to this world so that through Him we might be saved. Father, help us. Help all those, Lord, listening. Help our church family during this time. We'll thank you and praise you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll turn it over to you, Brother Alex. Amen. Thank you, Brother Tripp. Well, we won't, uh, we won't keep things going much longer, but I, I, hope, uh, I hope that the change, the, the subject of as of late, there's a lot of change going on. I think about my grandparents. They, they went through the Depression. Um, not that I'm applying that we're going there. And uh, Angie and I were talking about it, and her grandmother saved aluminum foil. Now, in the early 2000s, it probably wasn't completely necessary for her to, chain, to, uh, to save aluminum foil, but uh, what she experienced early in her life had changed her to the degree that it, it stuck with her forever. Um, and I, I guess your, your, your subject had changed for the last two services. That, that thought has gotten to me it, it is, you know, the physical things we see in the world that are going on, uh, they're sometimes easier to, to deal with. But um, to experience the change inside and to, and to keep with it and not forget about what it was like before, uh, especially as we come up on Easter and what, what Christ did for us. I just I hope that change can be everlasting. Well, if, uh, if you don't have anything else to add, I think we're going to wrap things up. As I said before, we've got a few more faces of our church with their, with their thankfulness, and, and we'll, uh, we'll spin that up now, and we'll be back with everybody on Wednesday for our midweek Bible study and prayer. We're praying for you. We love you. Reach out to somebody. Talk to folks. Uh, pray for us. Pray for, pray for our church family, our loved ones, and uh, we love you. And here, here's some more faces of thankfulness.